Peter Cradlett, live on Sky News Australia. Welcome to the show. Steve Price in for Peter Credlin tonight, pre-Easter, and I'll be here with you, of course, on Good Friday tomorrow night with our Friday night program. Happy Easter to you all. I hope you all have a great family long weekend. Here's what's coming up tonight on Credlin. My call in a moment for political leadership on the out-of-control Alice Springs riot that led to a dusk till dawn curfew for children and teenagers. The Northern Territory Police Union will join us on what it means for their members on the ground. Financial guru Terry McCrown will be here on what the collapse of cash security firm Armaguard would actually mean for those of us who still want to use cash. Plus, could Victorians be about to be hit with a new property land tax? And security expert Michael Shoebridge will join us on just how vulnerable our shipping lanes to the north are and what a conflict in our region would mean for imports and exports. Plus, 1% of solar panels on Australian roofs are actually made here, as Chris Kenny just told you, with 90% of them made in China. So the Albanese government today pledged to invest $1 billion of your taxpayer dollars into an outfit to make them here. Graham Lloyd from The Australian has a look at that for us tonight. But first up on this Easter Thursday, we can't let this week pass without wondering where strong political leadership in this country has disappeared to. Off the back of a week of political chaos in Canberra, featuring incompetent ministers who would have been booted out of their jobs back in the days of true political leaders like Hawke Howard and even Keating, we're crying out for strong, tough, cut-through leadership. And we certainly are not getting it from the current Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese. Now, the PM seems like a bloke who doesn't want to upset anyone, a bloke who wants Australia to love him and not respect him. And the Alice Springs riot Tuesday resulting in a curfew that, as I said, bans kids, children, teenagers from the CBD for two weeks is a classic example of where the Prime Minister just doesn't get it. Now, I've got an example that Anthony Albanese over this Easter break could use if he doesn't quite get what strong, passionate, cut-through leadership looks like. And he could do worse than sit down and watch this a few times to get the idea. Now, this example comes from the Senate yesterday. And sure, it's delivered by someone who's been directly affected by the lawlessness that is Alice Springs a year on from when the PM was last there. And it was delivered by Senator Jacinta Nampajimpa Price. It sums up the frustration and anger that the Prime Minister himself should be showing. This is how tough it has got, where we have hundreds of people rioting our streets, acting out violently. This is following a spate of violence, crime, death, bashings of 16-year-olds. It was only just a couple of days ago that I stood here to condemn traditional cultural payback in my home community and the treatment of young Indigenous women. The violence has escalated to the worst we've ever seen to this government. Stand up and pretend you care about Indigenous Australians with all your platitudes of acknowledgements to country and respecting Elders past and present and emerging, whatever the hell that means. It means nothing when our most marginalised in our community continue to suffer and now that bleeds out into the rest of the community. Our businesses are packing up and leaving. Long-term residents are leaving. We have had a gutful. They have to send in the riot squad, the ADF, whoever it takes to bring calm to our streets. How many more deaths have to occur? Doesn't matter, does it? They're just Indigenous kids, right? If we had actually decided, instead of not removing Indigenous kids from dysfunctional circumstances, that they might not be committing crimes, fast-tracked into incarceration, dying on our streets. The racism is the fact that they are left in dysfunction because there are weak leaders who are more worried about votes than they are about saving lives. And I've had a gutful, as has my hometown community. Outstanding cut through, honesty and leaving no one in any doubt where she stands, who she blames and what she thinks should actually be done. Have a look, by the way, of contrast at the Prime Minister's defensive explanation today around questions of why he wasn't on the Prime Ministerial jet heading to Alice Springs to show Australia that he actually cares. 
Um, what I do is I make announcements when I'm going, when I'm going. I have visited the Northern Territory nine times. Nine times. I have visited the Northern Territory nine times and uh, I visit uh, around Australia very regularly. How many uh, times were Alice Springs? I have been to Alice Springs, I've been to Catherine, I've been to remote communities where I was last week. I've been, I've been to Yulara, I've been to Darwin, I've been to a range of communities in the Northern Territory. As you heard in the background, the reporters kept saying, what about Alice Springs? Now, instead of waffling about all the places he's been in the Northern Territory, like Darwin, how he'd been there nine times, so what the issue is in the Alice, Prime Minister, you had a flyby there last year and you've not been back. And it's no better. In fact, it's worse, as Jacinta said. And then you end up in the front row after that quick visit to Alice last year at the Australian Open Tennis. Four hours in the Red Centre, three nights at Centre Court. What's that about? Who's advising this bloke? He could have easily minimised the damage from a horror week in Canberra by simply junking the diary and turning up today at the troubled remote town of Tears. I suspect, though, hanging over him and the rest of federal labour is not wanting to be seen to be doing what in many cases needs to be done here. Troubled teenagers who reckon it's OK to be pitching bricks at the glass doors of a pub, terrifying everybody inside and stealing cars and smashing others with bricks and invading people's homes and businesses. Some of these teenage vandals heading toward a life of booze and drugs and crime need to be removed from the town itself, as Jacinta said, and where necessary from those families which are dysfunctional and from those town camps where some of their elders don't appear to care or can't care because of their own addictions. Many living off welfare, witnessing domestic violence of horrific regularity. How can that be good for a good example for any of these children? Take them out of harm's way, though, and surely that's the right thing to do. And guess what? You'll start hearing about a modern-day stolen generation when what I'm actually suggesting is that some of these kids really need to be part of a rescued generation. Come on, Prime Minister, step up and be brave. Let's head to Canberra now for tonight's political headlines with Sky News political reporter Trudy McIntosh. Touring wine country in the Hunter Valley, Anthony Albanese can't escape the detainee saga he left behind in Canberra. This is closing a loophole which is there in the legislation. This is about uh, people who have uh, not been shown to have any right uh, to be in Australia. Labor failed to rush through new powers to jail detainees who refused to cooperate with efforts to deport them. The crackdown was only revealed on Tuesday morning. By Wednesday, the government demanded it pass Parliament. Well, everyone had time to scrutinise it. But the Senate voted for extra scrutiny. An inquiry will run until May. Despite that, the Coalition has now offered to pass the bill earlier on one condition. The government is able to do what it hasn't been able to do this week, which is demonstrate genuine urgency. We will bring the Parliament back. We will bring our members and senators back, whenever required, to pass this legislation. They were for it on Tuesday. They were against it on Wednesday morning and deferred it and then said maybe Parliament should come back to vote for something that they had just voted against voting for. After a bruising week here in Parliament, the Prime Minister hinted at better news for Australian winemakers this Easter long weekend. When uh, the impediments to trade with China were put in place, the trade was worth in 2019 uh, $1.1 billion every year. Now, we reckon that the resumption of trade, which we think is imminent, uh, will see an even higher amount. Four years after China slapped a tariff of up to 200% on local wine, final decision is due by Sunday. It's in our interest to export wine, but guess what? It's in the world's interest to receive our wine as well because it's a fantastic product. So this is absolutely a win-win. A win that will be well worth a toast. Trudy McIntosh, Sky News, Canberra. Good on you, Trudy. There you go. Alice Springs, 
or a winery in the Hunter Valley. It's just unbelievable. Look, there's plenty of other news to get to, so let's bring in my first panel for the night. Media writer at The Australian, Sophie Ellsworth, has joined us, and Deputy Executive Director at the Institute of Public Affairs, Daniel Wild. Sophie and Daniel, welcome. Always great to have you here. Daniel, just on that editorial comment uh, of mine, political leadership, what's happened to it? Well, where is it? That's the big question. I think Jacinda Price has been a standout. Uh, we saw that through the Voice campaign, where she speaks about the interests and concerns of mainstream Australians. And look, she's authentic. She's not scripted. Yeah. I remember the National Press Club address she gave uh, during the Voice debate, when she talked about our history and our colonial history, and she just spoke her her views of the world based on her lived experience that Australia is not a racist nation. We're a great nation. That's and a great point you make because when you think about it, Anthony Albanese lives in in a city, Marrickville, or now lives at Kirribilli on yeah. the harbour and at the lodge, he's never really had that... I mean, he always goes on about how he had a tough childhood, and yeah. maybe he did, but he doesn't have a tough life now. She does. She said in the, the Senate yesterday in a longer grab that she had to intervene in a domestic violence dispute to stop a woman being bashed. I mean, Sophie, that's, uh, this is the real politicians we need. Oh, absolutely, Steve. And as Daniel says, during The Voice, she was an absolute standout. I would argue that she's the reason, a big reason, why The Voice did not get through. Jacinta has been through so much herself, lived that experience. They always talk about this lived experience, but she really speaks from the heart and can say what is happening on the ground. I mean, she lives in Alice Springs. She talks about it like a real person. She puts aside that politician hat and I think relates to people and they do listen to her. Danny, you've got to go back, I think, to Tony Abbott to have mm. the last Prime Minister that exuded that lived experience. I mean... You know, he never told anyone, but he's out on an RFS truck battling bushfires or he's down at uh, Manly working as a volunteer lifesaver. I mean, he lived in a community and, and felt it, didn't he? He did. And it gets to this bigger point, which is the professionalisation of politics, where our political class is drawn from a narrow, narrow, narrow set of people. They've been to, you know, often good schools, gone to, you know, universities and so forth. So we're lacking, you know, we have every other kind of diversity, but diversity of experience. So that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the political class becoming more out of touch with regular people. It was a great start of the day for me because... Uh, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Sally Capp, finally decided she was going to resign and not stand for re-election. Here's a bit of what she said in her media stunts this morning about that decision. I feel so honoured to have been part of Team Melbourne. Uh, everybody that works here at the City of Melbourne, traders, residents, stakeholders across the City of Melbourne, as we've worked really hard to revitalise this magnificent city of ours. Hardship out there for traders and residents in the City of Melbourne and that important work must continue. But the trajectory is undeniably positive. Sophie, um, that dress she was wearing, apparently she wore it on the day that she was sworn in as Lord Mayor eight years ago and decided <laughs> that she would put it on again today. She was all about through this whole period. And, look, I have some sympathy that she had to run Melbourne during COVID. Mm. I give her that. But it's all been about photo opportunities, hasn't it? Well, Steve, yes, she did have that difficult period during COVID and she had to come up against the Premier. But I would argue that she led a lot of businesses in Melbourne's CBD down during the pandemic. This is also the Lord Mayor that has, in my view, made it very difficult to get around the city. We are now got bike lanes that were battling. It's basically an uncar friendly city. Uh, she was intending invasion, attending Invasion Day ceremonies. She was being chauffeur driven around from, you know, Town Hall down to uh, Fed Square and saying that was OK. I think she did a lot of things where she was not practising what she was preaching. And I think a fresh start for Melbourne as a, with a new Lord Mayor coming in uh, when the elections are later this year can only be a good thing. Daniel, she also uh, took off to uh, the Middle East to a climate change conference. And I think a lot of this bike lane stuff was unbelievably actually driven by their emissions targets that they set as a Melbourne City Council, thinking they could solve the world's climate. So they said, let's get cars out mm. and then we'll be able to prove that our emissions have gone down to the detriment of everybody who wants to use that, use that city. 
Well, it's been a period of total failed leadership. One of the worst Lord Mayors this city has seen, uh, whether it was the COVID failure. She actually said COVID was good for Melbourne, if you, if you remember that. We'll tell that to the businesses and the workers who lost their jobs. There was the attempts to cancel Australia Day. One of her last acts was to institute the council voice to parliament just after 60% of Australians had voted no to the voice to parliament. There's the homelessness, double the rate of the statewide average. And she initially supported a drug injecting room, which has made the city a much more dangerous place. I can't think of anything that she has done good for the city. No, and look, I've written a column about this for the Herald Sun tomorrow. I've actually suggested what we probably should be doing is having a Melbourne commission to run the city, not have these elections of these second-rate councillors to run a big city like Melbourne, get some decent people in there and then have a, a working executive underneath them and not do it the way we have. Sophie, the um, uh, AFL rocked by this story that the mm. Herald Sun, Michael Warner, broke during the week, that AFL players have been allowed to go off to a doctor and if they test positive to having used recreational drugs, they were then given a convenient excuse not to play on the weekend. Mm. I can't see how this is not real reputational damage to the AFL. Uh, well, it's all unfolding, Steve, so I'll be cautious in my comments. But it, from what we have seen in the media, this is a very bad look. Uh, the AFL's had numerous issues, obviously, with the Essendon drug saga several years back. I think they've been too focused on being too political, uh, too woke. They should be focusing on real issues. And this is very... If this all uh, stacks up, and as I say, a lot of it's still coming to light... Very bad look for the AFL. Daniel, not a good good for parents who are thinking about their kids going into uh, AFL as a sport. No, that's right. And look, it's a new CEO of the AFL and he's failed his first test. I mean, the cover-up is often worse than the crime. This looks bad. I don't know whether he's going to survive the season as things currently stand. Um, as Sophie was alluded to, alluding to, they can tell you how to vote yes. They can tell you how to vote in same-sex marriage. They can berate their fans with behavioural awareness officers. But whenever the, the blowtorch is on them, they say, well, there's nothing to see here. Um, it's just not good enough. Uh, it's basically condoning unlawful use of drugs. It just shouldn't happen in Australia and certainly in a sporting code. Daniel, Sophie, great to have you with us. Thanks. Great work. I'll uh, talk to you shortly. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, the Alice Springs situation, I want to go back to that, the terrible situation there. Reports from the first night of the curfew, at least, that was positive. But, of course, it's just one night, and unfortunately, I fear it's going to take even more than a curfew to quell a situation. Joining me now, someone who knows what it's like on the ground, uh, that is the police officers who are tasked with enforcing this curfew, the President of the Northern Territory Police Association, Nathan Finn. Nathan, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for your time. What has your members' reaction been to this curfew and how difficult is it going to be for them to handle it? Yeah, good evening and thank you for having me on. Obviously, uh, it's important to our members. Our members are actually struggling there in Alice Springs on a day-to-day -day basis to keep up with the demands of the crime down there. Um, we've had concerns with this legislation that was obviously, and the, and the act that was obviously declared last night. Um, we're basically saying that it's potentially unlawful what the government's done here by introducing this uh, change to the Emergency, Emergency Management Act. Um, we've gone to that today and um, the government has doubled down saying it's, it is lawful and it's um, fully justified what they're trying to do. But our members have got concerns down there that they could potentially acting unlawfully um, given this legislation that was obviously, uh, and, and the declaration that was made last night. One thing that uh, worried me, there was a report I saw earlier today that on the night of the riot, the existing police officers who were on the ground in the Alice, they confronted a number of these people. I think there was at 1.200 at that funeral. They confronted them and some of them had weapons. Now, these weapons weren't actually described, but they could have been anything from a, you know, a machete to a, a lead pipe. Uh, and your officers themselves were at one point almost thinking they had to draw their own firearms... Have you heard that? How, can you confirm it? And how hard would it be for an officer staring in the face of a 13-year-old kid with his hand on his gun? Yeah, that's correct. And it puts them very, in a very dangerous situation. Our members have obviously expressed to us on a number of occasions they were placed in dangerous situations, heavily outnumbered, sometimes up to 60 to 1 of our officers uh, and being obviously forced backwards and had to obviously uh, technically disengage from that situation. So they weren't injured themselves and placed in that dangerous situation. Unfortunately, the NT government has proceeded with this uh, curfew that they're placed in Alice Springs, again, making it very difficult, even if it is lawful, uh, for our members to do that role as well. Given that's a, a restricted area, uh, we've only got the ability to convey use within that area. We can't actually convey them outside of that 
unless they actually consent to it. So really, it's just a Band-Aid solution to a, a huge problem that we're seeing within the Northern Territory, not only in Alice Springs, but right across. Uh, and, and it's also being fielded by other um, law enforcement agencies across Australia. So uh, what do they do when they confront uh, a teenager in the CBD in this two weeks? I mean, I don't know what two weeks is going to do. I don't know what the good, that, good that's going to do. But what can they do? They can remove them... Can they arrest them or do they have to remove them and take them back to a town if camp? Comply, what do they do? If they don't comply with, obviously, that request, um, they have an opportunity to, obviously, um, they are committing an offence. So our members have an opportunity to, obviously, lock that up. But that's the last thing we want to, want to see for a youth in custody that's obviously just trespassing, obviously, in the CBD area. Um, we want to see them actually stop committing offences. This is not actually dealing with the, with the members committing offences. Um, this is not an opportunity to, obviously, go into the huge problems that we have in these towns, but our members are actually restricted about what they can actually do. So they can drop them to the edge of the area where, where it's declared as the CBD area. But then again, we've got a duty of care to that youth as well. We're just dropping the edge of town and basically just let them be. What happens if something happens to them now? Our members are quite concerned about the duty of care that they obviously they place. They've been in police custody. If something's to happen to them, who knows what's going to happen to our members? And we want protection for those. So in the situation uh, that we have now, and I know you mentioned Nathan Towns, I mean, this seems like window dressing to try and make the rest of the country feel that something's going on and the politicians are doing something in Alice Springs. And yet, as, as you know, well, well know, you've got problems in Darwin, you've got problems in all sorts of communities across the Territory, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. It's not just isolated to Alice Springs. Unfortunately, what you've seen yesterday on the news... Um, uh, and, and national wide, it's it's not an uncommon occurrence for us up here um, for these sort of situations to occur not only in Alice Springs but in Darwin, in Catherine, in Tennant Creek, in our major centres on a daily basis. The unlawfulness and obviously the consequences that don't actually follow um, from these actions. Um, again, we made five arrests in relation to that Todd Tavern incident. Um, well, they're all adults; they're not youth. They weren't the youth that were involved in that. The youth weren't even dealt with in relation to that. The ones that were there. Uh, but when you got 150 plus people armed with machetes, knives, pipes, whatever they like to pick up and use, and then surrounding police as well, it's going to leave a, a police officer in an un inevitable situation where they're going to have to use lethal force to protect themselves and protect their partners. Got a horrible feeling, Nathan Finn, this is not going to end well. I'd like to catch up with you again. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. Well, there's the word on the ground, on the street about what really is happening in Alice Springs. Now, just before we head to the break, some uh, breaking news and good news. Great news for our winemakers heading in to the Easter long weekend with confirmation that the tariffs on our wine in China have officially been lifted by the Chinese government, ending three years of trade pressure. That's great news. But as always with China, we have to consider what we give away in order to restore that trade between our two nations. But that is good news. Right, coming up straight after the break, a new report that highlights just how vulnerable we, we are, talking about trade, should war break out with China. Uh, plus, when everything seems to be going wrong for Labor's green agenda, the PM and Chris Bowen's grand plan seems to be double down. More on that shortly. Welcome back. Steve Price in for Peter Credlin. I'll be back with you at the uh, same time, normal time, tomorrow night on Good Friday. Now... There's been a, a wake-up call issue today about just how vulnerable Australia's trade routes would be should a war break out in our region, which obviously would, would involve China. Let's, let's be honest, that would be the conflict. And we're just talking there about how our wine exports are going back into China. But if there was a global conflict, well, you can forget about exporting anything. An analysis of our shipping lanes, shipping routes, by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute has found that two-thirds of our exports, so the vast majority of them, and 40% of our imports could come to a halt if war was to break out. It is a very chilling thought. Joining me now to discuss this is the Director of Strategic Analysis Australia, Michael Shoebridge. Michael, welcome. Ironic that we're just talking there about uh, going back into China with our wine exports. Uh, if the shipping lanes were to be shut down during a conflict, we wouldn't be exporting anything. And how vulnerable are we on what we would be importing? Well, Steve, you're right. There's a real schizophrenia here, isn't there? Because 
There are two big problems if a war broke out and our overseas trade was interrupted, and that that is not exporting wine. Our two big problems are Australia is more dependent on imports from China than any other developed economy on the planet for things like electrical goods, uh, building supplies, even food. So um, instead of making that problem uh, better by diversifying our trade, our imports away from China to other countries, the current government is talking up trade opportunities with China to make the problem worse. That's problem number one. The other problem with the current government's approach is in the defence sector, they seem to not know what Australian companies can make that will be critical to our military in times of war. And instead, they're also making us increasingly dependent on supplies from overseas from big foreign primes. So the government needs to change course on two things. They need to push companies to diversify our imports away from China, and they need to invest in domestic defence manufacturing instead of doubling down on overseas supply. Does, has big business worked this out? I mean, we went through that two years of COVID and we had obviously the trade barriers with China and a lot of businesses did diversify, but did, have they diversified enough or are we simply now post-COVID just going to drop back into what we were doing before? Businesses are aware of the risks, but they need sustained, consistent messages from our government. And they're not getting that now. They're getting the Prime Minister visiting Beijing and Shanghai and talking up trade opportunities. And we'll probably see more of that if the Chinese Communist Party's Premier Li visits Australia in the next few months. Would China not also be uh, at risk here? I mean, if, if suddenly uh, Twiggy Forrest and Gina Reinhart's ships can't uh, head off loaded up with iron ore to China, they are, are they not going to have a major... Uh, a major problem with the amount of iron ore that they need to keep their country running? Well, yes. Uh, one of the big strategies, if there is a war with China, is to blockade their trade. But the Chinese, unlike us, have been stockpiling essential supplies, including things like coal and iron ore and food. They've also been investing in their domestic defence manufacturing base for decades something that our government is failing utterly to do. How easy so would the it be for China is, to shut down those... Sorry, go ahead. Well, well the question really is uh, Ch China is making steps to, to make itself be able to last through a blockade, but would Australia be able to last as long as China if there was a blockade? And unless we do more to make more for ourselves than we need in times of war and diversify our trade away from China, we would be the victim in that blockade. What would the blockade look like? I mean, how would it actually physically unfold? Well, uh, there are very uh, tight uh, sea lanes through places like the Malacca Straits up um, off, off Indonesia, and most of the trade between North Asia, a uh, whole lot to Australia and also off to Europe and the Middle East, go through those narrow straits. Um, and then there's the coast around the east of Papua New Guinea. The US Navy, probably with the Australian Navy, should we acquire any ships, um, will blockade Chinese trade and Chinese military vessels there. But if we haven't diversified... We'll be blockading ourselves. Always a pleasure to catch up, Michael Shoebridge. Thank you very much for that. And talking about uh, trade with China, I mean, we learned today that 90%, 90% of the uh, solar panels that are on the roofs of Australian homes are actually made in China. Now, the PM was in the Hunter Valley today. He was in that winery talking about the wine announcement. He was spruiking a $1 billion investment by Australian taxpayers, so that's you and me, into Australian-made solar panels. Have a look. These are uh, the most efficient solar panels in the world. These are good products. They will last for longer. And we are very confident uh, that uh, Australians will have Australian panels on their roofs.
Big claim, the most efficient solar panels in the world. Joining me now is the Environment Editor at The Australian, Graham Lloyd. Graham, great to see you again. Uh, what do you make of this? So this is uh, an Australian firm. I note the CEO standing there at the announcement today was some young bloke wearing a T-shirt. Uh, and we're going to hand over a billion dollars of, I presume, uh, levies and, and, you know, grants to this company to make these things. But... By the way, I interpret what the PM was saying, Graham. They're going to be bloody expensive compared to the cheapy Chinese ones. <laughs> well, well, this is the thing. <laughs> Good evening, Steve. Uh, look, politically, uh, the the government thinks that domestic manufacturing is a winner. So this is the beginning of a long road uh, in a lot of areas in this renewable space where the government wants to get involved and to uh, to make things happen. Uh, the problem is, as uh, solar panel firms all around the world have found out, uh, they can't compete with China on price. So the result here will be that these panels will be more expensive than ones we can get from overseas. Uh, so the argument becomes, is there an economic benefit in putting money into that rather than something else? Uh, in the energy space now, we're, we're seeing the government's going to subsidise panels, uh, it's going to subsidise... Uh, the uh, energy bills for people who have to buy electricity. It's going to subsidise everything all the way down the chain. Uh, so at some point it becomes uh, unsustainable. Uh, so, um, you know, good luck with the, the solar panel manufacturing. I, I think there's a lot more politics in it than there is economics. Well, given uh, so many millions of houses already have solar panels, is there a big market for more people to get solar panels? And the obvious question that you and I have talked about before and you write about all the time, how does the network cope with that amount of solar energy being fed into it from all of these little houses all over the joint? Well, I think you can say that there will be an enduring demand for panels because they have a, a relatively short life. So even the ones that are there will need to be replaced. Uh, the government's also keen to subsidise people to buy the panels. So it'll subsidise the manufacturer, then it'll subsidise the purchase. Uh, so I don't think there's a, a problem with demand. Uh, in terms of uh, the network upgrades to host the panels, well, that's another subsidy as well because... Uh, we're gold plating the network and that ultimately ends up uh, with either taxpayers or electricity users. So renewable energy politics always gets into things, Graham. The, uh, an important offshore gas regulation bill today was pulled by the government out of the Senate. The Greens threatened mm. to disrupt the vehicle emission standards policy and so that bill got pulled. The Coalition says, look, the delay puts the gas industry at risk the government just doesn't quite know where it's going, particularly with gas, does it? Well, it, it's tricky, and I think the uh, important takeaway from these developments is uh, that the Greens have got the government spooked in the Senate. Uh, the, the Coalition would have given its support for this bill to go through. Uh, the Albanese government chose to withdraw it uh, rather than uh, upset the Greens that uh, it wants on side for its vehicle emissions. Uh, the Greens are pathologically against the gas industry. Uh, the government seems to recognise the importance of it. Uh, and there's a, a tension there. And uh, in this episode, the Greens seem to have won out. Victorian government, Victoria, where I live, of course, have banned uh, gas connections for new homes and new businesses. Mm. You should add to that always. But they don't have, don't have the renewable capability here to replace our old brown coal power stations. There's a, a warning about a, a gas shortfall maybe as soon as 2025. I mean, we seriously are, and, and all the authorities are, are making this uh, clear. We're, we're sitting on the edge of, of, you know, potential blackouts, aren't we? Well, that's uh, the warnings are coming thick and fast that that's where things are heading. Uh, we're getting to the situation where gas is running uh, low, uh, so we're going to be burning diesel fuel instead. So uh, to argue against the, the emissions of something, uh, we end up 
creating more emissions, burning something else. Uh, the same thing is going to happen with coal if coal has to stay in the system longer uh, because gas isn't available to back it up. So these are the sort of unintended consequences of uh, trying to have an outcome without having a proper roadmap to get there. And it's writ large in the gas sector. Graeme Lloyd, appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you very much for that. Now, coming after the break, big changes might be on the cards for stamp duty in Victoria. I'll have all those details for you shortly. Plus, a bit later, my panel's going to weigh in on what might be Labor's worst week yet since they were elected as that detainee disaster rolls on. Welcome back. Steve Price with you. Now, there's a Victorian budget coming up, and it may be... Big changes coming uh, around the housing market. The Treasurer, Tim Pallas, has hinted a lot about uh, land tax and about stamp duty, two of the things that this government down here would love to get their hands on. Will it be stamp uh, duty reform or will it just be a whack to house owners? Now, Tim Pallas said by removing the one-off stamp duty tax that you pay when you buy a property, you, quote, liberate a lot of people to be able to move around the economy to better suit their material circumstances. Now, while it's unlikely the tax will be completely abolished, Pallas says he's working with industry to come up with alternatives. For more on this, I'm joined by business commentator from the Herald Sun, the great Terry McCran. What worries me, Terry, when you start having conversations about getting rid of stamp duty is that they are then going to introduce an annual land tax on everyone who already owns a house. Well, absolutely, Steve. I'm from the government and, and I'm here to help you. Yeah. <laughs> That's always the yeah, first right. caution we have to introduce to this. This is not about relieving the burden of taxation on Victorians. We know the terrible state of the Victorian budget. Yeah. $150 billion going for $200 billion of debt. This government is not about say, oh, we've got plenty of money, we can cut taxes. No, as you've indicated, this is what the proposal would be, and we saw it in New South Wales, is abolish the one-off stamp duty but replace it with a annual payment, a much lower annual payment. It looks good up front. So on instead, top of your rates, you're then paying another lot. Absolutely. Land. Instead of pay, but instead of paying maybe say sixty, eighty thousand in stamp duty up front, you might only pay five thousand a year. But that five thousand a year is forever on that property. It you know, you you well, as long as you own that property, it's and and it will go up, obviously. Taxes never go down. So this is not about relieving the tax burden, it's about imposing more tax. Would it be grandfathered on properties that are already well, if you, Yeah, exactly. Well, only when a property so it's changes only a, hands. When it changes hands. So it would only affect a small part that's of gonna, the... That's going to put a bomb through the real estate market. <laughs> well, it would be... And, and Why would you but, sell? Well, well, no, you'd sell because you've got buyers. I mean, that's the... There, there is a certain logic in it that it makes it easy for people to buy and sell houses. They don't have to think about a big whack up front when they buy a house. And as he says, you can become more flexible in terms of where you live. But the bottom line, let's be very clear, it's more and more taxation on Victorians. You think they'll do it? Uh, well, New South Wales has done it, uh, but you can only do it in a way where you don't immediately lose all that revenue. And it, it, this is particularly the case... A billion a year. Well, exactly. It's a huge, huge sum. And you can't go from $80,000 every time a property sold to $5,000 a, a year on the new new owner. Let's talk cash. Now, the uh, company <laughs> Armaguard, I only worked out this week that it was owned by Lindsay Fox, or Lynn Fox. It's received a $10 million lifeline from Lynn Fox as they try to stay afloat. And now, this is because no one carries cash around anymore. And so this has suddenly become a business that, that is not... Not, not only not profitable, but it's losing money. Well, cash was on death row before COVID, uh, Steve, and as we all know, COVID killed cash. Yeah. Uh, you didn't want to do transactions with cash. Although for small businesses out there, they are desperate to have cash, cash customers because of all those fees that are added to a transaction. It's, it's great if you just whack your watch on the <laughs> machine, but the business owner gets whacked on a... And you will also get whacked on a fee. So, we, 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 it's, again, it's not in our interest to see cash disappear and move to a society where you're just doing these transactions. The only time I get cash now is to pay the garden, someone to do the garden or someone <laughs> well, to do the cleaning. Well, That's exactly. the black economy, of Indeed, course. indeed. I mean, it's reinforced the whole black economy dynamic, the separation between having to use, using your phone or your watch to uh, do the transaction online 
or getting cash. Will we go cashless at some point? I, I think it would be a serious error for people to allow that to happen. You want to maintain the ability to keep cash. It's not just the crooks that want to store $100 notes. Individuals should always keep cash on hand. So uh, Coles today cut the amount of money you could take out at the checkout when you buy your groceries and say, I want $400 yeah. you used to be able to get, now it's $200. And they're having to store their cash somewhere securely over the Easter period. Yeah, it's, it's sort of crazy, isn't it? Uh, you know, that we, that we things like Armaguard, service like Armaguard, precisely to avoid that issue so that cash was only made, you could get your cash taken away and you get your cash delivered. A lot of older Australians don't want to just tap a card. No, absolutely. And I'm, you know, I'm an older Australian, you're an older Australian, yeah. and it makes a lot of sense. The younger Australians should understand that if they allow the government to impose a totally digital reality, it's not going to be in their best interest long term. Terry, always great to see you, mate. Thank you very much for that. Terry McCran, you can read him in the uh, Herald Sun and the Australian across the rest of the week. Now, after the break, how much longer can the hapless Deb O'Neill and Andrew Giles hold on as their latest detainee legislation goes bust? Plus, uproar in the Senate as Labor rushes through, Terry was just talking about this, digital ID laws, yet again not wanting a proper debate. I'll take you through that with the panel after this. Welcome back, Andrew Bolt, coming up next. Let's bring in our panel, former Liberal MP Nicole Flint and Pauline Hanson's One Nation Chief of Staff, James Ashby. Nicole and James, welcome to you both. Nicole, hand on heart, have you ever seen a more chaotic week than what we've just witnessed in Canberra? Uh, no, it has been an absolute debacle on behalf of the Labor Party and the Prime Minister. And it is... Unbelievable that this criminal detainee migrant crisis is continuing almost 12 months after Labor were warned by the High Court back in June last year that they were likely to hand down a decision that would mean that people who were being held in detention would be released. Labor have had almost 12 months to fix this. They have failed to fix this. We, we've got people who have uh, have committed more crimes in the community, people who have managed to go to court to get their ankle bracelets taken off. And still, Labor has not managed to introduce legislation to fix this mess, and it may be, a, it may be about to get worse, Steve. I have never said... Sorry, I have seen something like this. I take it back. We have seen this movie before. It happened during the Rudd, Gillard, Rudd years. This is a total incompetent failure by Labor. How Anthony Albanese has not sat Andrew Giles and Claire O'Neill is a mystery to me. I was about to ask you, under the various Prime Ministers you served under, if you were as useless as one of those two, do you think you would have caught, caught, kept your job? <laughs> no, definitely not. I mean, it's just extraordinary. I mean, what happens now if the High Court rules more de detainees are going to get released, James? Well, the problem is Labor will just let them free. That, that is the biggest issue. And Nicole's right. We passed legislation uh, through both houses just before Christmas that was supposed to deal with these individuals that re-offend again. Now, we've had 18 since they've been released. None of them have had orders to return back to prison. So they're on a slippery slope, Labor. And look, the Coalition, One Nation and Ralph Babbitt had the common sense to say, you showed us 20 minutes before this legislation went up. How are you supposed to expect that we trust your legislation? The, the unintended consequences we see on a weekly basis with Labor's legislation, it, it, none of it makes sense. I don't think this would have been drafted properly. And for good reason, it's going through an inquiry through the Senate. Just while we're on uh, fresh legislation, James, the government's digital ID bill has passed the Senate. That happened, I think, last night. Now, under the proposed scheme, yep. you'll be able to have personal details like your passport, birth certificate, driver's licence, all linked in together. Uh, I know One Nation's got real issues with this. What do you think those potential issues are? Well, you are handing over very precious, sensitive data. And we've seen now with state actors from uh, whether it be Russia or China, they are desperately trying to get their hands on uh, people's data here within Australia. The government are basically storing your biometrics. It's not just your licence. I know here in Queensland they, they uh, launched a Queensland app, cost over $53 million to get your licence on your telephone. 
less than 10% of people took it up. So people do not trust the government with their private and personal information. Uh, it's phenomenal, isn't it? And I don't think they're going to trust this either. They've got every right to be sceptical. And they say it's an opt-in measure. Yeah, right, COVID shots were an opt-in measure as well. What they'll do is they'll simply say to you, oh, you want to travel overseas, you want to take that cruise, oh, you'll need a digital ID. Oh, you want welfare benefits, you'll need a digital ID. Oh, you want this, you want that. From any service within government, they're going to want you to sign up to it. I say no. And if we hold the balance of power in the next uh, Senate, I can tell you right now, we'll be putting forward legislation to get rid of this. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember the debate around the old ID card and it didn't w end well uh, mm. for the government trying to put it through. Now, Nicole, you're a glutton for punishment. I understand <coughs> you're going to contest your old seat of Boothby. Uh, has appearing on well Sky done, convinced you that this is a, a good thing to do, Nicole? Steve, I will say three things to you. First of all, uh, if I was going to... Um, give a, a national exclusive. Uh, I think Peter Cradlin might be a bit upset if I did that with you rather than with her, uh, dear friend Peter, <laughs> who's not with us tonight. Um, secondly, as you would well understand, uh, what may or may not be happening within the Liberal Party with pre-selections uh, is, is a matter that I can't discuss because it's an internal party matter. Thirdly, it was an absolute honour to represent my wonderful community in Boothby between 2016 and 2022. Uh, when I when I retired, we did incredible work together. We fixed age-old problems like the Oaklands Crossing, for example, that have been an issue for 40 years. And, uh, Steve, I tell you what, we did not have the cost-of-living pressures that we are currently seeing under this Labor government, and we certainly didn't have criminal detainees wandering around our communities. So uh, we need to get rid of this Labor government and nothing would make me happier. A, I would never step on the toes of Peter Credlin. I'm not that silly. And B, thank you for the Oaklands crossing because my 90-year-old mother, who still has her car and drives and lives in Brighton, can now get down yes. to the Marion Shopping Centre a lot easier than what she used to be able to do. So thank you very much for that. Hey, James, what do you make of these proposed reforms to the NDIS scheme? Uh, this thing's now costing $42 billion. New legislation introduced yesterday says it'll crack down on the annual 11% increase in people going on to NDIS and it'll stop automatic top-ups. Mm. Bill Shorten's in charge. I would say that... I mean, this is his ticket back to the top job, I would, I would think... But is he going to be able to wrangle this thing, as big as it is, back into some sort of shape? Well, Bill Shorten does deserve credit, not when he started the campaign, but certainly for attempting to fix it up. It's now blown out. It's worth more than what the Medicare bill is, and that services 26, 27 million Australians. Uh, this only services 600,000 Australians, and it is just blowing out all the time. Something needs to be done about it. I do take my hat off to Bill Shorten. I tell you what, if we ever get complaints in Senator Hanson's office or Malcolm Roberts' office or any other office um, with NDIS, he is the first minister not to just palm it off to his staff. He will take the call personally and he wants to learn about it. So I give him full kudos. To me personally, he's the only Labor minister worth keeping at the moment. And yes, uh, maybe he would be better in that top job while Labor's in government. I'd like a view from both of you. New first, Nicole. Should the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, who uh, was in Newcastle, Hunter Valley today and went to a winery, should he go back to Alice Springs? <laughs> oh, of course he should. Oh, it's just absolutely disgraceful uh, that, what, he turned up for, what was it, two hours and then flew off to the tennis? I mean, I've never seen a Prime Minister with his whose priorities are so wrong and so misplaced and you know yeah as you've just said wandering off to a winery or or wandering off to the tennis instead of being where he needs to be to help communities in crisis is reprehensible if you were his advisor james would you be saying hi tail it back to the alice yeah, I wouldn't go with him, though. He can go on his own if I was his advisor, because I reckon he'd get pelted just as much as the shops. Um, of course, he should be back there. Uh, there's no better way to learn what's yeah, happening on the I ground mean, than uh, being on the ground and speak and to these people. Looks, because the, and it just the looks bad, James, you're because, I mean, is, he hasn't been... He went is. there once and then he went off to the tennis. Nicole James, we've got to wrap it up there. Thank you very much. I'll be back tomorrow night. Andrew Bolt's up next.